All right, so this will be the bones and ligaments of the wrist and hand. Remember when we talked about the elbow, we had the radius and ulna. We were talking about the proximal ends of those bones. So now we're going to talk about the distal ends of the bones. And if you remember also that they both have a styloid process, which is named for the bone that it's on. So radial, styloid, ulnar, styloid. The ulnar styloid is the one you can feel much more easily. And it's going to be just at the base of your wrist on the back side, on the pinky side. That's the bump there that you can feel. So just like on the elbow, uh, when we get down to the wrist, instead of there being a radial notch on the ulna, there's an ulnar notch on the radius. Because if you remember, the radius expands when we get down to the wrist. It's larger, the ulna is much smaller. And so there's a notch for the ulna where those two articulate. So here's just a quick look at all of the bones and we'll go over them together. It's very similar to the foot. Um, so if you would think of this kind of like the tibia and fibula, these like the tarsal bones, now they're called carpals. And then we have all of our metacarpals instead of metatarsals and we have phalanges. So let's go through those. So with the carpals, there's eight carpal bones. There were seven tarsals, eight carpals, okay? So we got a proximal row here, which I'm outlining with the pointer. Now we're gonna start with this scaphoid. It's kind of shaped like, you know those peanuts you can get if you go to like Logan's Roadhouse or something. The peanuts you pull out of the ground, not the nice fancy ones you buy at the store. Um, that's what it's shaped like. And it's a pretty commonly fractured bone just because of where it's located. So there's a little tiny gap between these two. And so sometimes when we have certain types of injuries like falling, uh, that bone can get fractured just by the radius kind of pushing into it. Um, the next bone here is the lunate. And that one, instead of getting fractured, a lot of times it gets dislocated. It's very round, and so it's easy for it to just slip. It kind of looks like a half moon. So it's easy for it to slip posteriorly and uh, dislocate, which is pretty painful. And then the third bone, which is right here, is the triquetrum. We don't hear a lot about this bone. It's got kind of a weird name, but it's there next to the lunate. And sitting on top of it is our pisiform. That one you can feel pretty prominently if you go down to your wrist on the pinky side. There's a bump that you can kind of feel if you just feel right from the wrist up into the hand, and that's your pisiform. All right, so which ones are easy to palpate? Well, one of these we've gone over and one we have not yet, but the pisiform definitely, and then the hamate, which is just above it, it has a little hook on it, and that's very easy to palpate. So those two are very easy. Uh, which one is most frequently fractured? That would be the scaphoid. And what usually causes it, that would be a foosh. So now we have learned injuries in the wrist, in the elbow, and in the shoulder that can be caused by a fall in an outstretched hand. So when somebody has that kind of, you know, I was skateboarding and I fell off a skateboard, or I was walking and I tripped and I fell with my hands straight out, try to isolate where the injury is, but don't forget about the other potential areas where they could have an injury. Um, which bone gets frequently dislocated? That would be our lunate. And what usually causes that? That would be the opposite. So if you kind of fall and you're not prepared, you don't stick your hand out, fall on a flexorus a lot of times will cause uh, the dislocation. All right, so distal row here is going to be this row. And we've got, again, four bones. Starting on the thumb side, we have the trapezium. And the way I remember where that bone is, is trapezium goes with the thumb. So that's actually the bone that forms that um, saddle joint that's unique here between the trapezium and the first metacarpal. Right next to it we have the trapezoid, just a little bone there, and then we have the capitate, which is a pretty large bone. If you start at your middle finger and just feel all the way down to the wrist, you'll run into the capitate. It's a flat bone, nothing spectacular about it that you can feel, but it is one that can get stuck in wrists at times. Um, it'd be painful, so that's a common place that we have, you know, some issues. And then the hamate will be right next to it, which is this blue bone here. And it's got this little hook sticking off of it, uh, which can be fractured, can be painful, things like that. So we got to keep an eye on this hamate bone. All right, so how many metacarpals do we have? Same as the foot. So we've got five. Five fingers, five metacarpals. And when we number them, the thumb is number one, first metacarpal. 
All right, phalange is exactly the same as the foot. We have a proximal, a middle, and a distal phalange for each of the four fingers, and a proximal and distal for the thumb, bringing us to 14 phalanges for the hand. All right, now we're going to move to joints and ligaments. There are many, 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 many <laughs> joints and ligaments in the hand. Try to sort of keep them straight. I, to me, what makes the most sense is to sort of start, you know, at the radius and ulna and move down the hand. So we're actually going to do that and start right with the radius and talk about the true wrist joint, which is between the radius and these two bones, which we just talked about. This one is the scaphoid, so we've actually flipped the hand upside down now. Scaphoid is here, lunate is here, and that is your technically your wrist joint. Okay, uh, We've got eight carpals that move around. What type of movement is happening in those carpals? It's going to be a gliding movement, which makes sense because they don't twist, they don't do anything, you know, they're not, they're just little short bones, so they can't work like our long bones do. So they do gliding, and so that's going to put them into what category of joints? Back in your mind somewhere. Condyloid joints. Okay, so the wrist is a condyloid joint. How many axes can the wrist move in? Careful with this one. The answer is two. Now, if you thought it was three, because you're thinking, well, I can flip my hand back and forth, that movement is actually coming from your elbow, from the head of the radius, that round head. So that's an elbow movement, not a wrist movement. If you hold the wrist still, you can move it up and down and side to side. But you can also do what other movements? Circumduction. So you can move it in a circle, because it does move in more than one plane and axis. All right, so joint-wise, let's label the joints. Again, the radius is here, the ulna is here. So our first joint is going to be between that radius and the scaphoid and lunate. We call it the radiocarpal joint. So that, let me show you on here. This is the radiocarpal joint here. The next joint is going to be, I'm following the line of it. We we'll call it the mid-carpal joint. It's just going to be between that first row and second row of carpals. The next one will be right here, so I took a line and kind of drew across, carpo-metacarpal, between the carpals and the metacarpals, okay, and again, this is gliding movements we've got going on here. Intercarpal, of course, you've got eight bones here, so they are interacting with each other. I'm not going to name each of them individually, but just know that there's intercarpal joints, and again, they have a gliding motion. Okay, metacarpal phalangeal, this is the longest name of a joint in the body. Uh, this is a metacarpal bone. This is one of our fingers. So here's your proximal phalanx metacarpal. Here's where they come together. And we usually just call it the MCP joint for short because that's, again, a very long word. So metacarpophalangeal between the metacarpal and the proximal phalanx. Interphalangeal, just like the foot, we do have one interphalangeal joint in the thumb. And then we have the proximal interphalangeal joints here in the fingers and the distal interphalangeal joints in the fingers. I think these are pretty good pictures for you to visualize how the joints work in the hand, so definitely take a look at those. All right, on to the ligaments. Again, the capsular ligament is appearing because we've got that joint capsule around the joint, so it's going to run between the distal radius and ulna into the carpal bones and form the joint capsule. We have a volar radiocarpal ligament. This is really, again, if you're in an anatomical position, on the palm side of the hand, just stabilizing the front of that wrist joint. And then on the back side, you'll have the dorsal radiocarpal, smaller ligament, okay, because we have more stabilization on the volar side, um, but this will be on the back side of the hand. And then the next one you have is going to be your radiocarpal, radial collateral ligament of the wrist. So that's going to run on the thumb side. If you think of it similar to your elbow, it's going to be on the lateral side. So you could technically call this the lateral collateral ligament of the wrist. That's not commonly used, but technically that would be a correct name. And then on the medial side, we have the ulnar collateral ligament. Um, same thing, it's right here between the pinky bone and the ulna. And again, if you wanted to call it the MCL of the wrist, you could do that, but uh, generally we'll call it the ulnar collateral ligament of the wrist. 
intercarpal ligaments. Again, there are a lot of really specific names for them. Um, not something you need to know at this level. But this is why people specialize in hand and wrist physical therapy because there is so much going on in there that you really have to know and be specialized at what's going on in this and know all these specific little ligaments and specific little joints and all that. So not going to get into the details, but just know that the intracarpal ligaments are between the different carpals. Carpal metacarpal ligaments, again, same as the joint, is going to be between the distal row of carpals and the metacarpals there. Okay, and each one of those, just to give you an idea, each one of the five has four ligaments. So now we're talking 20 ligaments just at this one level, if that gives you an idea. I'm not going to ask you specifically about these. I just kind of wanted to give you an idea of, hey, there's a lot of stuff going on at each level of joint in the wrist and hand. All right, there's another picture, full-size picture for you to be able to view um, all of the ligaments. Okay, first metacarpal phalangeal joint, it's a special joint because that's around your um, saddle joint in the thumb between the trapezium and the base of the first metacarpal. The metacarpal phalangeal joints for all of the ligaments have a capsular ligament, they have radial collateral ligaments, so do the interphalangeal ones, but again, if someone sprains their finger, I'm not going to say, oh yes, you've sprained your fourth lateral collateral ligament of the distal, we don't get that specific at this level, but if you were interested in that, that would be something that you would do as a hand therapist. Okay, last thing about the wrist and hand, we have the retinacula again as we did in the foot, and we've got a flexor retinaculum. This one is something we talk about quite frequently because of its relation to the carpal tunnel, and it is here right on top of the carpal tunnel forming the, the bridge or the roof of that tunnel where we've got about eight different tendons that go through there, a nerve, some arteries and blood vessels. So it's a pretty important one to understand where it is. And then we just have the extensor one on the back. It's a smaller space, uh, but that does allow for the extensor tendons of the wrist and hand to pass through the little tunnel that it creates on the back of the hand. And that is it for the first video.